once there was a young couple. They met in elementary school. They fell in love in high school. And their married life was as happy as in just about every way, except one. They didn't have the child that they so desperately wanted. They tried. The wife was poked and prodded and tested, but the doctors suspected she might not be able to be a mother. At first, this made them very, very sad, but the couple trusted that God would simply give them a, a child in some other way. So they decided to adopt. They went to an orphanage, told them how much they wanted a child, and were shown a picture of a little boy in a blue and white onesie, uh, had blue eyes just like the husband. And he seemed to be smiling at them. And they knew right away that this little boy was supposed to be their son. So they went home and prayed and prayed and prayed. And the adoption agency agreed that this little boy needed to be their son. So the husband was now a father. The wife was now a mother. They went to get him. They wrapped him up in a blanket. And mom carried him home in her arms. Uh, he made them very happy. They loved him all the more because he was selected, not expected. Most children, most children hear Goldilocks or Little Red Riding Hood when they, they're tucked in at night. And this was the story. This is the story my mom told me. This is a story my mom told me every night before I went to bed. And we called it our story. And it was the first of many incredible gifts that mom and dad gave to me. The words were simple, but its power was in the delivery because mom had such a knack for making people feel important and expressing her gratitude in the most sincere and uplifting ways. Of course, this wasn't the end of the story. Turns out mom and dad could have children. <laughs> uh, my little sister Jennifer was born 18 months after mom and dad brought me home. Uh, and they loved her almost as much as they loved me. <laughs> That's kind of a long-running joke between Jen and me, and I think it probably is between a lot of siblings. But in all seriousness, we know there's no such thing as an amount when it came to Linda's love. It just flowed without end from a sweet and pure heart. And we learned that all over again when my nephew Jacob was born. Jen has always said that while she might have been a single mother, she was never a single parent. And mom and dad helped raise a grandson who makes them very, very proud. Mom was grateful because she got to make another little boy with blue eyes feel like the most special person in the world. And I think that was the job mom was born to do. Uh, family has really been the central focus of my mother's life and also the source of her greatest joy. Here's the thing about mom though. <laughs> Her definition of family was wonderfully expansive. She had her Carolina Ceramics family. She had her Log Cabin Arts Guild family. Uh, she had the Girl Scouts of Troop 159. And uh, she had the boys of Hilton Lawnmower and Densville Demons baseball teams. And she loved them all. In fact, I, in breaking the news of, of mom's uh, death, I found myself telling a lot of people how much mom thought of them and uh, how much she loved them. And I meant it every time I've said it. Uh, this has been a, a bittersweet exercise, but it drove home a realization I arrived at some time ago. When I was little, I used to think that the story mom told me at bed, that I was the hero of that story. But it's, it's not true. Mom and dad were the heroes of that story. The truth is, and they'd been shown the picture of some other little boy who needed them. They would have brought him home and they would have loved him just as much. Because that's just the way they are. 
I won the lottery. The day they adopted me, and I cannot begin to explain how grateful I am for that. Dad's not going to like to hear this, but I have a lot to say. <laughs> I don't want to dwell too much on the disease that, uh, that killed my mother. She battled the outward symptoms of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's for about five years, roughly 7% of her life. And that's a small fraction that doesn't begin to define her. And as the sting of her passing fades, I'm not going to remember that about her. Nonetheless, I don't want to ignore these diseases, particularly the dementia, because I know there are probably people sitting here who have dealt with this, who might be dealing with it right now, who might even be experiencing some of the symptoms. There's no cure, but mom would want me to say something that gives you hope that you and your family can face this with grace. I won't lie to you though, Alzheimer's is tough and it takes a heavy, heavy toll on the victims and their loved ones. We knew this long before mom was diagnosed because she was not the family's first tangle with the disease. My uncle Jack, mom's brother, recently lost a wife to Alzheimer's and in the late 1980s their father died of complications of the same disease. It's an insidious, insidious disease assaults you in every way imaginable, physically, mentally, emotionally. It forces victims into the care of those they've been caring for their entire lives, it makes you say things you don't mean, it makes you forget things you swore you'd never forget, and it robs you of the pursuits that once brought you great joy. For my mom, one of those great joys was painting. Um, as we were getting ready to put her in hospice care, I called one of our old neighbors who'd moved to another state many, many years ago, but uh, who stayed in touch with mom. And um, she told me she still had a stack of, of cards that mom had sent to her through the years. For a long time, those cards were prints of the paintings that she had done. In later years, those were uh, handcrafted car, uh, cards that she would just spend hours crafting for each individual person, each individual occasion. Our old neighbor really didn't know that mom had been sick, but she kind of suspected as much because in recent years, those homemade cards were replaced by store-bought cards. In fact, one of the tougher decisions for the family when we, uh, was what to do with all of mom's art supplies when we moved into a smaller house. In the end, I don't think we really couldn't bear the thought of parting with all of it. So most of it went in boxes, and those boxes went in the closet, and that's where they stayed and it felt like robbery. Um, I was putting uh, the notes together for what I was gonna say today in my parents' house, realizing for the first time that mom wasn't there. And it never felt so empty. Then I looked up to see the painting of a seagull on my left and the cardinal on my right. And even though mom's gone, her work is still here. And Alzheimer's can't steal everything. In fact, it can bring out the brave in you. I know Alzheimer's scared the hell out of my mom. She saw what it did to her dad. She dreaded the thought of becoming a burden to the people she cared about, the prospect of no longer recognizing family members who meant the world to her was abhorrent. And honestly, that's what scared me most too. When she was diagnosed, I figured I could take just about anything I wanted to be strong and supportive for mom, the way she had supported every endeavor, foolish or wise, that I'd ever undertaken. The one thing I knew that would wreck me though, was walking into her house, giving her a hug and a kiss, and realizing she would never again have any earthly idea who I was. But mom fought, and on the day, her neurologist confirmed what we had really long uh, assumed, she told us not to give up on her because she was not going to give up herself. And every now and then she'd kind of pull us all together for a family meeting and she would remind us of those intentions. Uh, and it was so sweet and we always ended up in tears because she'd tell us over and over that she had the best family in the world, which was true. And that was mostly because that family had the best mom. 
By that time, she wasn't able to accurately draw hands on a clock or solve simple math problems. She could no longer drive. Really, she never could drive. <laughs> but uh, dad took over the, the household chores, the cooking and the cleaning. And then mom went about the business of putting dishes in the wrong cabinets and rising up out of her recliner to go to the next room for no apparent reason. Mom and dad spent their evenings watching the news and Jeopardy and Young and the Restless. <laughs> and sometimes she sat in his lap, sometimes she sat in her chair and just seemed to kind of stare off into nothing, leaving us to wonder what, if anything, she was thinking. Then out of the blue, she blurt out the correct answer to a Jeopardy question. Uh, Dad held her hand through this entire journey. Mom passed away Friday literally minutes after she was placed into hospice care. Dad signed the papers and he and Jen went to a room to check on her. They sat on her bed, held her hand, listened to her breathe, and a few minutes later the breathing simply stopped. Maybe the timing was just a coincidence, but I prefer to think she waited not only until her husband and daughter were there, but also until her family was ready to take her life out of the doctor's hands and place it in the Lord's. When she finally surrendered, it brought her victory over the things she dreaded so much. The next several hours and days, Brought a lot of kind words of consolation, many of them in text messages and on social media. And Friday night, as I was trying to type a reply to, to one of them, kind of stopped in the middle uh, and realized that the thing that I dreaded most never did materialize. I never did have to kiss a mother who no longer recognized the son she selected 48 years ago. I think mom's passing bears witness to the indelible stamp of family that was impressed upon her but to understand that stamp how it got there you have to look at the beginning of her life not the end of it or at least you have to look in these front rows here and look at her her brothers and sister they all grew up in a farmhouse on a remote ridge in eastern Kentucky and when I tell you it was remote I mean, find the middle of nowhere and then go 10 more miles. Uh, they had about 60 acres to farm. Uh, they had some pigs and milk cows, and they had each other. And when I say they had each other, I don't mean it in that uh, kind of sappy, hallmark, see you next Christmas kind of way. I mean, they needed each other. Um, the road to their house literally ended in their front yard. And they had neighbors, but they were, what, a couple, at least two miles away. Uh, so they were kind of what they, they had. They had to be self-sufficient because they were pretty isolated. And yet somehow they managed to be a little overcrowded too. Uh, depending on what time period you're talking about, uh, there were seven to eight people from three generations uh, living in a house with six or seven rooms. And all that coziness <laughs> meant that mom's brothers and sisters were also her playmates and her best friends. And that remained true long, long after they left the farm. Jack was the oldest and the first one out of the house and the first to start his own family. And uh, he provided the template for mom in so many ways. And uh, as she fought her battle with Alzheimer's, uh, Jack was there to offer my dad some words of advice and encouragement and comfort from someone who knew this struggle all too well. For many years, mom and her baby sister Veda were each other's closest confidants. Even though they lived 500 miles apart, they were on the phone to celebrate happy occasions, but also to talk each other through big decisions and every challenge they faced. And Veda faced a lot of them. She suffered from juvenile onset diabetes and was in severely poor health really her entire adult life. And we lost her in 1992 at age 39. And I don't think I've ever seen my mom so hurt. But she coped as you would imagine that she would. Uh, and that's by pulling her brothers and sister even tighter. Her relationship with her sister Ina grew even closer and it was already pretty close. 
Ayn is the closest in age to mom. And they passed a lot of life's milestones at about the same time. Mom was married in 1965 and Ina in 1968. My cousin Wayne was, was born a year after uh, I was adopted. And Kevin was born a few years after my sister. And the four of us made a pretty tight little band of cousins when the family got together again on the ridge. And we spent a lot of time doing the sort of things our parents did. Fishing the ponds, climbing the trees, exploring beneath the cliffs. But it wasn't just a coincidence of marriage and birth dates that uh, bound mom and Ina. They would show up at many of those family gatherings to discover they were wearing the same shoes or carrying the same purse. <laughs> um, more than once, they purchased identical holiday cards that would pass each other in the mail. And Ina's an immensely, immensely talented artist with uh, much the same painting style and uh, often the same subject matter as mom. I really think they were, they were twins born four years apart. Then there's mom's little brother. And I'm pretty sure mom and Kenny never carried the same purse. Uh, but they do carry the same uh, reverence for their parents and appreciation for their upbringing. Kenny's the family historian and storyteller. And in mom, he had the most adoring pupil and audience. That's because he could talk her back to some of the happiest times of her life and he could make vivid again any dear friend or loved one who was beginning to fade. In the past several days, I've tried to think a lot about the right things to say today and what mom would want. And I drew a lot of inspiration from another of the most difficult days in her life when she stood in a funeral home and eulogized her mother. I decided that uh, what I needed to do today was try to be Linda's voice, decide what would she say if she were here to speak for herself. And when I thought of it that way, I figured it was pretty easy. She had a heart filled with gratitude. And she'd want to tell everyone who came here today how much she appreciates your presence and how much she appreciates the comfort that you've offered her family. She'd also want to take you each one by one, look you in the eye and tell you how much, she meant, how much you meant to her. And then she'd probably hand you a painting on the way out the door. Unfortunately, I'm going to fail in that task. I'm leaving out a lot of people uh, that she remembers fondly. But there's only one omission mom would never forgive, and that's my dad. Uh, as much as I know you'd love for me to shut up right now, I'm not going to. <laughs> We've talked a lot in the past few weeks about, about mom's wishes, and there's absolutely no doubt in my mind <coughs> that what she wants me to do right now is tell all these people about her hero. Not many folks make it to 52 years of marriage, and the fact is these two go all the way back to Elliottville Elementary School. Dad asked a friend to ask Mom if she liked him. Mom asked a friend to ask Dad if he liked her. Uh, so they became boyfriend and girlfriend. And that went so well, a few years later when they were in junior high school, they worked up the nerve to speak to each other for the first time. <laughs> they dated other people here and there, but eventually worked their way back to each other. Uh, and it's a good thing that dad fit in pretty well with mom's family because uh, they were around a lot. I think I and I chaperoned many of those dates from the back seat of dad's old car. And Kenny told me this morning the first drive-in movie he ever saw was uh, when he tagged along with mom and dad on a date. Uh, eventually they got to venture out on their own though, although that always didn't always go so well. Uh, one night, uh, dad was driving mom back to the ridge and they heard a thump. So they pulled the car over, opened the door to see what, what he had hit, and he got sprayed in the face with a skunk. Uh, I, man I guess they managed to get on to, to mom's house, uh, and Papa took a little pity on him and doused him in uh, tomato juice and drove him on home. And for their next date, Mom and Dad drove the car down to the creek to uh, soap it up and uh, spray it out. So there were big times in, in Moorhead back then. Um, I suppose at this point their uh, marriage really was, was probably inevitable. As I told you, Mom lived in the middle of nowhere and uh, while Dad might not have been the only guy who wanted to date her, he was the only one who could find her. Um, <laughs> He had some incentive to make that long drive because, well, he smelled like a skunk, and I think Mom might have been the only one that had him at that point. Dad's a year older than Mom, 
And after graduation, he moved about four hours away to Springfield, Ohio to drive a forklift in a plant where his brother-in-law worked. When mom graduated from Round County High School, a year later she had a decision to make. She could go to Moorhead State where she had a scholarship or she could marry dad. Uh, I think she chose wisely. Uh, mom was a lifetime learner. She could uh, study anywhere, but sometimes you only get one shot at uh, at true love. Uh, they worked hard, saved money, brought a cute little house in Springfield. Four months later, dad got his draft number called. They sold the house, put some of their belongings in storage. Dad and mom, dad took mom back to the ridge before he reported for duty. Mom spent the next 24 hours crying on the couch in the living room where they had been married just a few years earlier. But the next afternoon, Mom heard a rumble coming up the gravel road. All you have been on the ridge know what that rumble sounds like. Dad's car peered around the bend. Turns out he was legally blind in one eye, and the Army sent him home. Uh, so Mom and Dad were out one cute little house in Springfield, but they were back together again. Through the years, I think they probably put every one of their wedding vows to the test. Sickness and health richer and poor, good times and bad, each trial pulling them closer together. So I pause to consider it. I think perhaps that exa is exactly what trials are for. Mom didn't have an easy life. She had a wonderful life. I've kind of blubbered my way <laughs> through this a little, uh, and I'm sad today, and I'm going to be sad tomorrow. But believe it or not, I also feel great joy Mom doesn't have to be afraid anymore. She's been, she's been made perfect, and she's with Veda, and Papa and Granny, who've been made perfect too. The truth is, if my mom had lived 170 years, it wouldn't have been long enough for me. But no one lives here forever, no matter how much they're loved, and no one lives here at all without trials. There's a boy with no mother and another with no father. A woman loses her sister and a man loses sight in one eye. These are things that can make you bitter or they can be gateways to the most unexpected of blessings. They're gonna be whichever you choose. As deeply as I love her, as wonderful as she is, Linda wasn't a saint. She was just like you and me. She just made a lot of really good choices. She chose to seek the good in people because she knew she would find it if she looked hard enough. She chose to put her focus on other people because she knew that would bring her more fulfillment than a house full of possessions. She chose to count the blessings in her life and always found that they outnumbered her troubles. This is why I'm so proud to be Linda's boy and why really, that's all I ever want to be. Thank you so much for being here today. She, she'd really appreciate it.